Today we're talking about a female Cobra villain that has ties to Cobra Commander, Night Creepers, the Arashikage Ninja Clan, and even Lamborghini. Who is it? Today is all about Vipra. Anne A. Conda, yes that's a pun, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and then taken out into the swamp to be raised. Her rough upbringing formed her into, as her file card notes, a mean, nasty, and uncontrollable lady. This tough path she was on likely would have led her to joining the military, but she thought soldiers were wimps, and instead she turned to the Cobra organization. One of the things that appealed to her about Cobra was the snake iconography and identity, something personal to her as she too was named after a snake. She also liked the ruthless, war crimey, terroristic attitude of Cobra, and because Viper felt at home with Cobra, she was in her element and rose rather fast through the ranks. As General Hawk noted, Viper is small and slight, and this caused people to underestimate her, and so she constantly needed to prove herself to Cobra High Command, and she did exactly that, proving just how lethal and how valuable she can be. Cobra put her in charge of driving the Rattler four-wheel drive truck, something General Hawk notes she drives like a damn monster truck. She's as deadly in hand-to-hand -hand combat as she is behind the wheel. General Hawk also notes that she's one of the nastier threats to come out of Cobra's rank and file in quite some time. The first version of Viper specialized in intelligence and martial arts, but later specializations grew from there. Viper came out at an interesting time in G.I. Joe history. In 1994, just as G.I. Joe shut down its comic book series at Marvel Comics, Hasbro restructured itself and consolidated Hasbro Toys, Tonka, Playschool, and Kenner under the Hasbro Toy Group. The three and three quarter inch line picked up again in 1997, now under Kenner. Here there were new molds and new names, partly due to creative, partly due to legal and trademark law. However, these were largely deemed a failure, following on the failure heels of 1995 Sergeant Savage line and 1996's G.I. Joe Extreme. Instead of Larry Hama, Kenner had Tom Wheeler writing the cards, followed by David Lane in 1998, who was the head of the Steel Brigade G.I. Joe fan club and the editor of Fun Publications later on. And it was David Lane who helped create Viper and who wrote her file card. He was the same guy who wrote Viper's next card, and his intent was to build her into more than just simply a vehicle driver, fleshing out her story more. So the second Viper came out in 2004 as another Toys R Us exclusive for the Ninja Cobra Strike Team set. Lane got to add more details to her story and tweak her lore. She was now a pair of red-clad sisters, twin mercenaries that were the daughters of a legendary Arashikage swordsmith. These twin ninjas became the guardians of the Sacred Forge. So she's kind of the same and kind of different. Let me know in the comments, do you consider them different characters or different versions of the same character? But let's not confuse these with Jennifer Yen's Viper from Power Rangers Lightspeed and Time Force, whose release timing just happened to be right in between these Cobra Viper releases. In 2006, Hasbro and Devil's Due Publishing thought about including Viper in the Plague team. Honestly, she would have been perfect for that team, especially with them boxed with the Steel Brigade, who I mentioned has ties to Viper's creator, David Lane. Unfortunately, that plan came close, wait till you see the comic book in a moment, but it fell through. I don't love it when a plan doesn't come together. Take that, Hannibal. Another Viper was released in 2015 for the figure subscription service, now specializing as an intelligence courier for Cobra. She came with a briefcase, I guess to courier stuff, along with her pair of katanas and the unidentical twin silenced MP5K. Her file card deviates yet again. This Viper is a mercenary who offered her services to Cobra Commander and she got the job by sneaking into a private meeting he was having at extensive enterprises. Cobra Commander was intrigued. He admired her boldness and her skill. And with his need for a delivery person that he could trust, not just for pizzas and BBTS or entertainment earth boxes, but also to deliver an encrypted data package to Night Creeper Leader at what her file card describes as a heavily guarded temple. That explains the briefcase she comes with. Viper executed this mission perfectly and ahead of schedule, so Cobra Commander hired her full-time into his organization and then gave her access to any vehicle in the Cobra fleet for any method of conveyance. So that really would mean not just trucks and cars, but armored fighting vehicles vehicles, ships, copters, gliders, jets, sea legs, motherships, or even that big old red shuttle from G.I. Joe comic book issue 65. This gives her a lot more playability with the rest of your collection. This file card seemingly attempts to correct the discrepancies with her previous file cards by saying that she tenaciously defends the secrets of her background, using false histories and even deceptive attire to keep both friends and foe alike from discovering her true motives or the extent 
of her skills. This lack of any informational leverage and her willingness to use either stealth or high-powered weapons as the situation demands make her a very loose cannon, even for the Cobra organization. Then in 2023, Hasbro released to target another Viper for the Python Patrol subline of the Classified series. This one came with a skull mask, katana, wakizashi swords, a bow and arrow, and their quiver. Viper, whether by face or name, did appear in a couple comic book issues during the Devil's Due era. Those were issues 25, 31, and 33. This was well into the World War III event where Cobra was taking over the world, including the pit, and using their plague team for certain assaults. G.I. Joe was striking back, and it was Snake Eyes and Scarlet who managed to capture Vipra, and they sent her to a super secure facility called the Coffin for imprisonment. But then, Tomax infiltrated the coffin and killed a bunch of people like Headman and Cesspool, while others like Cobra Mortal, Firefly, Scrap Iron, and Vipra escaped. She's also on the cover of issue 33, though in what looks like a black and white outfit, a collar that looks like it's from one of the 2004 twins. No version of Viper was animated. Viper's 1998 action figure was boxed with the Cobra Rattler four-wheel drive vehicle, and that was a repaint of Toys R Us's Cobra Night Attack four-wheel drive Stinger, with the Stingers being a reuse of G.I. Joe's Vamp. So remember that was a weird time for names and molds? Well, this Rattler borrowed its name from Cobra's Jet of the same name. The same ground attack plane that Wild Weasel flew so skillfully against G.I. Joe Ace's Sky Striker Interceptor and Air Superiority Fighter, arguably giving him the upper hand in skill. This vehicle, as I mentioned a moment ago, is based on the iconic Vamp. Here's a link to an older video I made focusing on G.I. Joe vehicles at the beginning of a series that I started and honestly haven't built on in a while, but I really want to. For convenience though, here's what I said about the Vamp. The Vamp and the Cobra Rattler four-wheel drive are powered by a 4.8 liter V12 fuel-injected twin-turbo engine, which gives it a range of 550 miles and an impressive top speed of 140 miles per hour on a four-wheel drive and independent suspension system, especially when you consider the Rattler's weight when laid with its ground-to-air rockets whose 360-degree rotating launcher is mounted on the aft portion of the vehicle. It has a ram bar up front and a roll bar to protect the occupants on board. It also boasts a pair of gullwing doors for easy dismount, though that doesn't provide extra armor protection when a dismounted warrior is using the door for concealment. This Cobra version, just like the Vamp, is a powerful, highly maneuverable light utility and light attack vehicle, and it has a very real-world counterpart. The U.S. Army contracted with Willys Overland Motors during the Second World War to build a series of 4x4 trucks, which became known as the Willys Jeep. Over 500,000 Willys were built and sent overseas for the war effort. The Willys was replaced by the M38, followed by the M151 Mutt, the military utility tactical truck. This had exceeded the M38 during the early 1950s and through the Korean War. And then starting in the 1960s, the military sought to replace the M151, so they put out an RFP which multiple companies like FMC responded to. FMC Corporation developed the XR311 that had a torque flight auto transmission. They had multiple engine options such as a small block rear-mounted 5.2 liter V8 that could put out 190 horsepower or a 5.9 liter V8. There was even a V8 turbo diesel prototype. The Army outfitted four with 10 capacity tow anti-tank missile launchers, three with 360 degree traversable M2 machine guns meant for a recon roll, and three with 762 Mike Mike M60 machine guns, which could also take 5.56 millimeter rounds or even the XM174 grenade launcher. Another received a 160 millimeter recoilless rifle with six rounds mounted above the roll cage. These were the originals plus the additional models built after it was sold. When the 70s hit, along with a global fuel crisis, companies like Lamborghini took a hit when sales of the Miura declined, and so they sought ways to supplement their income. This is where the Lamborghini Cheetah comes in. The four-seater off-road vehicle dubbed the Lamborghini Cheetah also used Chrysler's rear-mounted engines like the 360 cubic inch 5.9 liter V8 with auto transmission that could make the Cheetah top out at 104 miles per hour. In the United States, a company called Mobility Technology International, MTI, took whether it was inspired, borrowed, or stolen remains for debate, but they used the design cues from FMC's XR311 entry and sent them to Lambo in Italy for the build. It was so similar, in fact, that in 1977, FMC had to file a lawsuit against Lamborghini. This, in effect, bankrupted Lamborghini, though they were saved in the 80s. However, this era of Lamborghini's history was not the Lamborghini that you know of today, although they do have that cool Starado now. Lessons learned from the Cheetah's development helped with the LM001, the Lamborghini Militaria, and the LM002, the Rambo Lambo, whose lessons were also applied to cars like the LP500 Countach. The current Lamborghini Urus owned its pedigree to the Cheetah in the later LM002. 
At the end, neither FMC nor Lamborghini won the contract. The U.S. gave the contract to AM General to develop the high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, the iconic Hummer, while G.I. Joe received the vamp. For more on this, check out that vehicle video. Since this too is called a Rattler, let's explore that for a moment, since I love to digress. The plane Rattler is based on the A-10 Thunderbolt, aka the Warthog, not to be confused with G.I. Joe's Warthog Amphibious IFV. The Thunderbolt is actually the Thunderbolt 2, taking the name from the prolific P-47 Thunderbolt, an amazing ground attack plane of its own World War II era time. The Thunderbolt is essentially a massive Gow-8 cannon with wings. In fact, many people say that the plane was built around the cannon. It's so powerful that when the BIRT starts, the entire airframe shakes, making it surprisingly less accurate. In fact, the flight control system has to take over when the trigger is pressed to help mitigate some of the thunderous effects. Designers had to make the gun slightly off-center, though still firing on the center line, so that when a round is fired, the recoil wouldn't push the plane further off target. One magazine can hold over 1,100 rounds and has a firing rate of 3,900 rounds per minute. So with a couple second burst, you're putting out about 65 rounds per minute, allowing for multiple passes over your target. It even has washers for the canopy window because it gets so much gunpowder residue caked on from those really short bursts. But as impressive and breathtaking as that Avenger cannon is, the real killer on the hog is the AGM-65 Mavericks, which are very lethal air-to-ground missiles designed for close air support. The Air Force's common fleet initiative to re-wing the airframe and integrate more SDBs or small diameter bombs onto its hardpoints gives it added use, lethality, and firing range, and more guarantee that it'll stick around at least until the next decade as the Super Warthog. And here's a fun fact. DARPA even put out a PCAS, a persistent close air support unmanned version, an A-10 drone. The Hog has good maneuverability at low speeds and high survivability rate thanks to its titanium tub and manual reversion backup mode, a literal fly-by-wire capability that can get a pilot to safely RTB even when the wings and tail are all chewed up from gunfire. It can take direct fire of up to 23mm and indirect fires from 57mm shells, but due to its slower speed, it's now susceptible to man pads which is why they're working in more longer range capabilities. And even as the Super Warhog upgrades are put on the table, the Air Force keeps trying to replace the A-10C with the F-35. So from Thunderbolt to Lightning, well, very, very frightening. And on that note, that's a wrap on this, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.